Upon initial observation, the mouth of Rosler Library looks like any other library. Thousands of books are sorted, other materials are placed, not always tidying on shelves. Signs and walls inform the visitors that they are welcome to look through everything that is there and though items are not to be removed from the library, tables and chairs are available so that people can consult them at leisure. A photocopier has been provided, thereby allowing portions of the materials to be reproduced and read elsewhere. And given the library a homely touch, pot plants are dotted around and upon shelves. However, for all the familiar trappings of a library environment, our first impressions are belied by the fact that we are standing in a gallery space meant for the exhibition of artworks. Collected over a lifetime by the prominent North American artist Martha Rosler, the library contains works of art history, poetry, travel, science fiction, mysteries, children's books, political and social theory, photograph albums, posters, postcards, magazines, dictionaries, maps, and newspaper clippings. Her library, consisting of over 7,600 items, so this is just part of, of it here, was first displayed in Eflux's exhibition space in New York in 2005, partly as a response to a personal quandary. In essence, Rosler's library was overcrowding both her home and her studio. A conversation with artist and Eflux co-founder Anton Vidolki resulted in Rosler resituating a, sub a substantial portion of her library to Eflux's exhibition space, which is kind of what you see kind of here. Subsequently, the library travelled between 2005 and 2008 to several galleries and art institutions in Europe, including another project spearhead, spearheaded by Vidolki in Berlin titled United Nations Plaza, which was an alternative temporary art school established um, in Berlin before returning to for a concluding display in Amherst, Massachusetts. Because of his exhibition history, we're dealing with an art library then, but evidently not in an ordinary sense that this is a library of art books, rather it's an art library to the degree that this collection and its display is intended as an art work. The Martha Rosler Library in that regard exists in relation to numerous other examples of artworks that take form as libraries. Some instances of his overarching tendency can be interpreted as continuing pictorial and sculptural traditions within art practice, albeit adapting and altering those practices by incorporating manifest, manifestly discursive and archival elements. In mind here, I have instances such as Anselm Kiefer's monumentalizing a high priestess, Sebastian Lund um, from 1985, 89, so you've got these kind of lead-bound books, which are incredibly heavy, apparently, to pick up. Carter Attia's The Light of Jacob's Ladder from 2013. And, and hello. We have technical issues. If I hit escape and then go back in. Oh. Ooh. Ah, yeah, that, that, that works nicely enough still. And, and, and uh, Yinka Shonabere is colourful. The British Library, which always provide the beholder with configuration to look at and ultimately observe from a distance. So you're not really kind of meant to sort of take books off the shelves for the most part. Martha Rosler Library operates according to a different strand within this tendency. Her assorted books are not meant to be viewed in a strictly visual and corporeally detached mode common to many displays of artworks. Instead, we're invited to, to peruse the shelves, pick up and read through the books, learn from their contents, and or take interest in Rosler's underlying, and underlying passages and scribbled annotations. In other words, we're permitted and indeed encouraged to behave with his artwork in very much the way we might behave in any library, hands-on and directly involved. As such, it parallels a diverse 
oeuvre of, part of participatory and communal artworks, promoting engaged types of spectatorship that became increasingly central to late 20th century art practice. Examples in addition to Lamarfa Rosler Library proliferate, and amongst their number, we could mention examples like Thomas Hershorn's The Bataille Monument, which had a, a library as kind of part of it, and Mashat Garba's Museum of Contemporary African Art Library, both of which were significantly included in Document 11 in 2002. These art libraries not only elicit physical engagement from the spectator, and entwined with the intersubjective or community structures that become crucial to the art world for a number of reasons in the late 1990s and early 2000s, they also reflect the widespread expansion of research forms in or as art practice during the same approximate period. And just as an example of kind of that, I'm just going to point towards uh, Rene Green's uh, partially buried in three parts kind of installation. As such, these practices necessarily impel us to muse upon a number of questions. Perhaps firstly, given the context of this conference, why we ought to construe Martha Rosler Library and similar strategies as artworks. Secondly, how we measure the communal participation they intend and or garner. And finally, thirdly, their relationship to debates concerning research in art and wider ways about the conjunction with the issue of knowledge production within what economists and philosophers have designated as post-Fordism. What responses are proper won't follow the order of the questions, nor will they really constitute answers as such. But my hope in any case is to give them some preliminary accounting. Let us return to, to the Martha Rosler Library and begin looking in a more active and tactile manner. The volumes on the shelves are evidently not distributed according to any long established system of ordering, but instead are situated in a manner akin to what the influential art historian and librarian Abby Warburg characterized as the law of the good neighbor. Thus, for those invested in particular intellectual frameworks and, and histories as Rosalie is, the substantial portions of the collection are readily navigable a case study of how personal library management can be token plausible narratives as opposed to strict classification and still make objective sense. The stacks are divided into 15 sections given an alphabetical designation running from A to O. Each item belongs to a particular numbered shelf and each item is likewise assigned a number so it is known where it belongs on a particular shelf. For example, the first item present and catalogued is Jeremy Lane's science fiction novel, Yellow Men Sleep, which occupies a first shelf and stack, and therefore given the class mark A1-1. Straight after this is A Merits, The Face in the Abyss, is class marked A1-2, whilst the second copy of that same novel is A1-3. The stacks vary great in number, a is by far the largest, with 4,412 items, while L is the smallest, incorporating really late 20th century, four late, four late 20th century novels. The division of stacks, likewise, are prone to variation, with A1 amounting to 36 books, A2 to 19 books, while N1 mentions 231 items in total. Finally, themes shift wildly within each section. For all that it is in Quincy though, one never feels entirely lost in a library of Babel. Books by a single author are largely grouped together. What strikes as fragmentation at one level can nonetheless coalesce into sense at another. Leaving aside fragmentation for a moment, it's worth stating that the crossover from private bibliophile to public display and utility is rather unusual. Libraries amassed by artists typically receive little recognition and artists don't seldom make much use of them. Robert Smithson, a North American artist who had a short but meteoric and highly influential career, constitutes a rare example of, of an artist whose book and vinyl collection has been fully catalogued 
and publicized according to his death, um, pu publicized subsequent to his death in a plane crash on 20th July 1973. Just one of kind of Smithson's art. I don't have a photograph of Smithson's library. Um, the closest I can kind have of found to a, a photograph of Simpson's Library was a, a project by Conrad Backer, where he's been making these kind of a sculptural reproductions of all the books listed in Smithson's Library. There's also a British artist, Jamie Miller, who's done his own attempt to kind of recreate Smithson's Library. Uh, not only Miller's projects, which I quite like, doesn't have any decent photographs I can find online. So I've kind of left that to one side. As with Rosler, it demonstrates an artist that is extremely well read within a diverse range of interests. And to that degree, cutting one, one's eye over the list of books does profit insights to his ways of thinking about the world and how that fed into his art practice and writings. It's worth adding that Rosler's or Smithson's bookish sentences hardly, are hardly out of step with a generation of artists. Although exceptionally well read, both artists emerged within a context defined by massive transformations within North American art education. Smithson's own library and his categories obey categorical logic because they were imposed after his death. And they certainly reflect established modes of library organization, even if privately determined or arrived at post-mortem. Martha Rosler Library, however, evinces a process of categorization being disrupted. For instance, within A1, the first five books are early 20th century weird fiction, followed by one book on the history of written script, and then three books related to Bolivia, a volume on, Can on Canadian mountain police, and immediately after, four books on speaking Spanish. If these categorical transitions seem mostly rather abrupt, then inclusion of the book about the Canadian Mountain Police, bracketed either side by approximately Spanish-themed texts, is strikingly random. As well as the law of the good neighbour, also present here is another system characterised by disjunction that is evident throughout the Martha Rosler Library. This second disjunctive system fundamentally depends upon the other system and its more conventional, albeit personal logic. Indeed, disjunction receives its fullest impression precisely via its dialectical negation of, of a system typified by conjunction. I'll just quickly check what I'm doing on my time. Ah, oh, okay, I'm more or less on time, a miracle. Uh, Rosler's utilization of conjunction and disjunction suggests the Martha Rosler Library betokens montage strategies. Montage as an art practice in which discrete elements are juxtaposed together in often jarring fashion has, become, has been a recurring procedure in Rosler's oeuvre for decades. Her early works, House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home, and Body Beautiful, or Beauty Knows No Pain, so this is a Bringing the War Home here, two examples from that. And this is a body beautiful or beauty knows no pain. Were photo montages which combined images taken from a variety of magazines. The former appropriated images from interior design alongside photojournalism from Vietnam, while the latter intermixes visuals from domestic appliance and beauty advertising with pictures from pornography. Perhaps Rosa's most celebrated artwork the Bowery in two inadequate descriptive systems extends this strategy of disjunction by juxtaposing nondescript photographs of the impoverished Bowery area of New York with words metaphorically referring to drunkenness. So if I do a bit of a close-up for you, can I, there you go. Moreover, the Bowery piece evinces how the logic underpinning montage can be readily applied outside of traditional montage forms. In that respect, then, it becomes plausible to apprehend the Martha Rosler Library as a continuation of Rosler's long-standing engagement with montage. For a number of European avant-garde artists and writers in the 1920s and 1930s, montage staked its claim towards significance as a new art medium on several fronts. Its overall deployment of photographic and cinema technologies reflected 
how these had become vital to our sense of visual culture in modernity, while also refusing to naturalise th these representations. So in some ways, that kind of debate about kind of visual literacy and AI, you sort of see kind of here in the kind of montage, the kind of the fakeness of these kind of representations. It's sort of meant to be, a, you have your sort of attention drawn to them. Montage's usage of jarring juxtaposition rather than harmonious composition, moreover, had the virtue of signaling, accelerating hustle and bustle, and manifold distractions competing for our attention within our increasingly urban existence. Refusing to merely resemble conditions of experience and emergent technologies under modernity, those experimenting with montage sought to make beholders and lookers become more reflexive and into participants in the elaboration of meaning. For the critic, Walter Benjamin, montage induces heightened attention and transforms the viewer reader into producers, rather than disinterested or passive receivers of art and culture. The mouth of Rosalind Library likewise serves to produce heightened forms of engaged spectatorship. Although this rather late this is rather late in my paper. The name or title is certainly worth remarking upon. It's not Martha Rosler's Library, but the Martha Rosler Library. In titling the work, Rosler eschews the possessive apostrophe and said opts for a word in that allows for a modicum of institutional impersonality, as well as subtly creating space for the public. If the possessive were there, we might imagine that Stepping into the library would become a socially awkward encounter, in though we have been invited. The absence of that possessive apostrophe, however, depersonalizes that collection enough to remove any lingering concerns. However, while this welcomes a visitor into the library, inviting them to make the space their own in some measure, the montage structure underpinning the arrangement of materials <coughs> entails the visitor to become proactive and even willing to submit themselves to intellectual labour. The absence during its display of, cat of a catalogue meant that the visitor had to peruse the shelves, the vinyl organisation of materials, and ultimately accept that it was less a case of searching than of discovering particular items. Indeed, the emphasis upon discovery results in a visitor's attention potentially being caught by books and other printed matter that they hitherto didn't know existed or perhaps didn't know they were looking for until they found it. That discovery, as well as the admixture of logical order and disjunction, also enjoins the visitor to reflect upon how systems of categorization, such as we find in libraries generally, evince specific cultural and intellectual horizons. As useful as any library system may be, it needs to be remembered that it is contingent, decidedly man-made, and mirrors and thereby produces certain ideological biases. Just as photo montage demonstrated that photography's claims to documentary realism are questionable, Rosler's biblio montage counters any assumption of the library's organizational naturalism. Through such actions, Rosler bids us to consider how knowledge is produced rather than exists as a reflection of the world Libraries are, after all in their own way, forms of representation. For library is through awareness of how representations are contrasted and an exploration of what kind of representations best serve us that we begin to understand and assert our own agency. We become engaged citizens. This then is a community kind of Oslo seeks to generate a space for via the library. Such a community perhaps doesn't pre-exist the space created for it, but it's certainly plausible possible if it comes into being through it. Throughout her career, Rosler has been concerned to reach a diverse audience for not just her own practice, but also to contest art world elitism and fulfill at last the democratic potential for art first ascribed in the late 18th century. She has attempted this in the past by holding garage sales within galleries, combining performance art with everyday activities, thereby bringing both art world and non-art world audiences together in such a way they could construe themselves as instituting a single but variegated audience. In an act of sharing and making common, 
Martha Russell Library continues that endeavour by acknowledging not only the library's communal function, but also its radical potential. Indeed, libraries give us power. Thank you very much. <laughs>